uh, no disclosures uh, whatsoever. Um, I, think, I don't think Steve actually does as far as uh, nothing relevant. relevant to this talk, at least. So um, for our practice, uh, we first started considering switch to a DAA back in 2017. Um, the major reason for it uh, was a lot of patient, patient interest. Um, even back then, a lot of as been outlined before, a lot of literature and kind of advertising on the internet, especially through the United States, uh, about the, the joys and wonders of the DA approach. Uh, and I must say at that point, I was a, a major skeptic. And, uh, but you hear enough uh, people coming in uh, and asking about it, it kind of perks your interest a bit. Um, so that was probably the, a major driver. So uh, we ended up looking at the evidence and as outlined already, it's, it's a bit conflicting um, as far as, you know, ups and downs, but I won't belabor that. Um, and another factor was uh, we had a colleague that was also local uh, down uh, on the highway a little bit, instituted a program um, in Penticton and uh, was having great, great success uh, with implementing his program. Uh, and uh, we felt that you know, it, it was a good opportunity to get on his uh, momentum to a large extent. Um, the other aspects that we thought was, you know, very useful uh, in our situation was the uh, potential for uh, an ERAS program uh, as far as getting people out of hospital uh, quickly. <clears throat> All right. The host stopped our video. Is it over here? What's going on here? Can you guys see uh, Ross and Steve? They're, they're presenting off of mine and I can't, my video's not allowing me to start. All right, all good. Okay, he'll just keep. We can see the slides, guys. We can't see your faces. All right, I'll put your video on. That makes you fortunate. Yeah, you're yeah. lucky, you're lucky. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know Ross, you, you have such a wonderful, uh, wonderful face there. I think we need to somehow see it. Oh yeah, there we go, hey. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. All right, there we go. So. We want to go back a slide, I think. All right, so yeah, the ERAS stuff and uh, as far as the early recovery from anesthesia, same day discharge, uh, not requiring that, that same bed utilization um, and getting uh, throughput based on not requiring that um, uh, was a huge uh, motiva motivating factor. Uh, and personally, I thought the x-ray uh, integration like Raj uh, had already brought up uh, and that ability to really dial in and, and ensure your offset and the leg length um, cup positioning all that was is as accurate as you could keep it and since both of us are uh, were relatively early in our careers uh hadn't been too set in our ways we felt that changing up uh the uh the practice uh, wasn't so onerous uh we weren't totally dinosaurs as it were uh from uh, lisa's talk so how we went about doing it um so there was I said before, uh, Dr. Bell down in Penticton had already uh, got a program up, in, up and running in Penticton. Um, and he had brought in, uh, I think, Dr. Sharma to talk to our health, our hospital administration and health authority about getting the program started and giving the various benefits of getting that going. So uh, we were fortunate enough to piggyback on that momentum. Um, so they ended up getting a donor for the hospital uh, from the hospital foundation that was uh, able to purchase a HANA table uh, to get the program running. Uh, and based on uh, conversations with other people starting this up, we felt that that uh, would be the best uh, in our hands as far as instituting a program here uh, rather than doing it uh, with a standard operating table. So both of us ended up going to the cadaver course and uh, getting familiar with the approach on uh, people we couldn't hurt um, and uh, going to, uh, through a couple of uh, dissections with that. And uh, I had the opportunity to do a visiting uh, day with uh, Dr. Sharma in Calgary, seeing how his program was running. And uh, Dr. Sylvester ended up going out to Ontario and uh, having a similar experience with a surgeon in Mississauga. It's actually Toronto. In I Toronto? Got you yeah. got it wrong? Yeah. It was Toronto. Okay, there we go. Um, so when we started to get going on this, uh, Dr. Sharma was kind enough to come uh, out here and uh, get us uh, the program up and running. Uh, so he assisted us uh, with the first eight cases over two days, uh, four apiece. Uh, and then Steve and I went on, basically assisted each other for the first 10 cases of, of the piece to kind of double up our learning uh, curve. Uh, you can see what the other surgeon was doing and get extra experience that way. 
Um, I think Raj had a slide that kind of brought this up, but as far as our patient selection for the first 30 to 40 cases, it was very, very conservative <laughs> as far as patient body habit is, uh, various anatomical reference points. And we were just, you know, tiptoed through the, the learning curve as, as safely as we could. Um, and as far as that aspect of it, uh, certainly, you know, at least they brought this up as far as the learning curve and the, the patient risk uh, factor associated with it. Um, during the initial consultations for people going through this, I certainly uh, laid that out for them uh, in entirety, just to be sure that they were aware um, that if they were choosing to go ahead with this particular approach, that this was early on in our experience here. Uh, and therefore there was likely going to be an increased risk of complications. So, you know, I, which I thought was entirely appropriate just that they knew what was actually going on. So as we became uh, more and more comfortable with it, uh, we started expanding our kind of indications uh, as you expect larger patients uh, with body habitus that uh, are more kind of average, we'll say. Uh, distorted anatomy, elderly patients, uh, failed hip fractures with the DHSs and, and uh, the cannulated screws, um, some basic uh, metastases and fracture care. So uh, I think uh, as we came more kind of comfortable with the approach and uh, the outcomes, uh, being enthusiastic about what we were seeing, we started broadening uh, who we were you know, using this approach for. So our current situation here, uh, we have three surgeons doing DA uh, hip replacements uh, in Kelowna now, uh, Steve, uh, myself, and uh, Dr. Kurtz. Uh, we all use the hand table for it, so none of us are using the just an off-standard operating table at this point. Uh, we had a, you know, as it was successful and the enthusiasm for it locally, we had a second donor uh, willing to purchase a DA table for the, uh, for the hospital. So currently, um, you know, uh, from my perspective, pretty much the majority of my primary surgeries are done through a DA approach, uh, simple revisions as far as a component exchange uh, and um, you know various uh, short uh, stem uh, femoral exchanges. Um, Asked tabular revisions, we're starting to think about doing. Uh, I don't know if we've gotten doing that too too uh, vigorously yet. Occasional bipolar, depending on surgical assists. Um, as far as the stability assessment. Um, I think I'm the only one still uh, doing this these days, but uh, as far as taking the, uh, the boot out of the, uh, the spar and uh, doing a traditional dynamic test uh, makes me feel better. I don't think it's actually necessary. <laughs> it thinks more for me than anything else, but it makes me sleep at night. So there we go. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think how it went. So initially, <clears throat> It certainly expanded our operating time. Uh, we were around uh, half, one hour and a half to two hours, depending on uh, the case. Um, within the first 30 to 50 cases, that dropped uh, quite reliably to around an hour, give or take. Um, so by about six months on in, we'd returned to our previous caseload doing four, uh, four primary joints a day. Um, and that's continuing. Um, we did four today, actually. So. It's been, and I said, average times, I would say somewhere between 50 to 70 minutes, depending on, uh, on you know, patient factors. Go for it. All right. Okay, we'll switch over to me. So um, in terms of the learning curve and how this actually felt to do, I'd say the first six months were considerably more stressful than uh, what we'd experienced previously when doing our surgeries. Now, I was maybe a little bit more uncomfortable with, or more, more comfortable with changing because I'd recently changed from primarily lateral to uh, drifting more towards doing a posterior approach. So things were already a little unsettled for me, but um, both of us uh, uh, definitely found ourselves thinking a little bit more the night before about what we were going to be doing and sweating considerably more. And that wasn't just the lead, which incidentally did get uh, completely saturated on at least one occasion. <laughs> Uh, this femoral exposure tended to be the most difficult thing initially, which I don't think is a surprise to anybody who's tried this or anybody who's read about doing it. And there's also some challenges with the staff not being familiar with the techniques that we're using, uh, with the equipment that we're using, even running the table, uh, getting the appropriate x-rays and so on. Uh, after about six to 12 months, as Ross was alluding to, we're getting quite a bit more confident. Uh, the exposures were less uh, difficult. Uh, the, everything just started to click 
and to run a lot more smoothly. And the OR times, as he said, dropped considerably, which meant less time pressure on the day to get your cases done, less stress, and just a generally speaking, more tolerable experience for everybody involved. And since then, as he sort of indicated already, we've been just sort of expanding our tech, our indications and really refining the techniques, little tricks uh, and tips that we pick up and pass on to each other and from others as well that really do make things quite a lot easier, um, which is, of course, the case with all uh, approaches. This is just a little graph that we cooked up to show kind of a visual representation of how our case volumes actually increase. Now, keep in mind that we were very conservative initially with our patient selection, and also keep in mind that COVID has played havoc with our, our access to the OR. So it's difficult to really um, give an accurate representation of how things went. But basically, this is combined numbers for us. We started late in 2018, so the numbers there are quite low. And then I would say in 2019, we still weren't doing as many people as we normally would. But even with significant OR reductions in 2020 and 2021, this the number of people that we're doing via DA has really increased, and that's reflected in these numbers. And it definitely has become the primary approach both of us use for, I would say, 75 to 80 percent of our uh, primary hip uh, patients. We did have some complications, and it's important to discuss those because everybody's going to want to know about those. We had two dislocations, one each uh, early on in our practices, one at six weeks and one immediately post-operatively, and both were revised uh, and did well after that. Uh, there were femoral cra cracks uh, for them, one of which was trivial and we did not uh, repair. Uh, we had a Karai stem in that person, and they did extremely well with no problems. Uh, the others were wired, and that was not particularly difficult. I did notice a question there uh, asking about access for wiring. Uh, without going into the details of it, it's really not a problem at all. Uh, we've had a few infections, but certainly no more than we would expect for similar numbers. We're at about 600 in total uh, between the two of us at this point. Um, a couple of wound breakdowns uh, with OR debridements. We didn't have any of the uh, much discussed the trochanteric fractures, although I did manage once to put a homin directly into somebody's trochanter, but that didn't actually cause a fracture, fortunately. Uh, we had no femoral perforations, which might be due to the stems that we used. Uh, we generally use either a karai or an actus stem, which have a very blunt tip on the brooch, and that just really doesn't lend itself to easy femoral penetration, in our opinion. Uh, we had no major nerve palsies, femoral or otherwise. Uh, there are LFCN palsies, and pretty much everybody has some degree of that, and pretty much everybody gets better and pretty much nobody cares one way or the other at the end of it once they've uh, recovered they're quite happy with their hip. Uh, we've never had any knee or ankle fractures or any other uh, uh, fractures uh, which I know have been reported in the literature and we had one transfusion that we can recall. Keeping in mind we're not formally gathering data but when you're trying a new approach pretty much everything that goes wrong, wrong is essentially burned into your brain so it's hard to forget most of these. Uh, in terms of ex what went right or what we like about this, we noted right from the start an excellent acetabular exposure, uh, really very good. A femoral exposure at this point especially has really been adequate for everything that we have ever needed. We cemented stems, we use cementless stems, we use relatively long stems like a cry, we use short stems like an actus and others. Uh, we've been able to wire. Uh, we've done a couple of removals, stem removals, both of which were well ingrown, I might add. Um, without any difficulty in terms of access. And we've managed in a couple of cases when it's necessary, especially for a very tight canal to get a long straight reamer down the femur, or at least I have, and that access wasn't difficult. I've never put in a really long revision stem through this approach, but based on my experience with that, I think it would be possible if you wanted to try it, provided you had the experience. Um, we really like the x-ray. We like having the access to referencing component position, offset leg length. I know we've talked about that, but especially in cases of distorted anatomy, such as say a dysplastic hip or a deep protrusio, which we've, we've done uh, several of these. It's just really nice to know exactly where everything is. And at the end of the case, to be very satisfied that everything's as good as it can be, as Raj pointed out. Uh, it definitely helps with repairing fractures uh, and uh, yes, the complex cases, distorted anatomy. Um, We've had very good success with the same day discharge program. And this was an added wrinkle because we didn't have that either when we started this. So we kind of started both programs at the same time. But, um, you know, just going along pretty standard criteria for this, we've had uh, a really good success. In fact, pretty much everybody that we earmarked to go home does manage to. Occasionally they don't. That usually has to 
do with not actually being able to get physio or somebody to see them and get them up or because it takes too long for their spinal to come out. So those are usually the things that uh, limit us. Occasionally, one of our anesthetists will prefer to give uh, uh, narcotics in their spinal and then there'll be lots of vomiting and that might hold us up too. But uh, overall, we, we've done very well with that to the point where we're now considering and working on expanding that to a total knee program uh, as well. And then just in anecdotal experience, this is not data. So take it with a large grain of salt, but our experience with uh, the early outcomes for our patients have been excellent. You know, you have those occasional patients when you're doing a lateral or posterior who come back to see at two weeks. That's usually when we see them the first time. And they're doing great. They're walking around, they don't have a cane, they don't have any pain, they're just delighted. That was occasionally before. Now it's most of them. Um, and uh, I would say that, you know, as I said here, the top 10 outcome percent outcomes for the standard approaches is more or less the average of what we tend to see with, a, with an anterior. But that's, as I said, totally anecdotal. Um, sorry, sorry. we are in the hospital. Somebody's losing it on four east. Um, so uh, then we have uh, where we're going next. So we are using a, an x-ray navigation system or trialing it. We've not had much of our access to play with it, so it's a little early to make any uh, conclusions. So far, it's been interesting, but it's not yet clear that we're going to continue to use it or that it's uh, hugely uh, changing anything for us. We'd like to do some revision, uh, uh, more revisions through this approach, but we'll need to actually be able to travel easily to do that. So that hopefully will happen soon. You do need two assists, and we've been toying with the idea of whether you could be doing at least bipolars with a single assist. Uh, so that's an area to examine. And then, of course, there's technology coming down the road, uh, robotics, uh, things that might get rid of the need for an x-ray, for instance, so there's no lead and no uh, radiation for everybody. That's worth thinking about, but that's so far down the road that it's not really really something that we're uh, actively pursuing at the moment. That's it.